Greetings and salutations, friends, and welcome back to the Horus Heresy Lore Breakdown. We are now on book number 24, Betrayer, and... Oof. <laughs> just, just so you're forewarned, Betrayer is a good book. And it features Khan and, you know, that, that other less interesting character. Um, I believe his name was... Uh, Ag Agagon, or Ag Agronon, or Agronon, or whatever. Nobody cares about him. He's a boring fucking character. <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry, but it's true. Angron is a boring fucking Primarch. And it's a shame, too, because Angron in his early life is actually pretty goddamn interesting. But ever since the Emperor, for some insane reason, decided to just abduct the dude instead of crushing the tiny army of primitive savages trying to attack Angron, he's, he's been quite moody, and he's been quite a large bitch on top of that. But, of course, we have, obviously, Khan. And Khan is the character that Angron should have been. Khan is anger, he's violence, he's the path towards corn, the path towards damnation, but put within a human framework, given motivations, and even given a, a reason to resist his inevitable fate. As we saw in a short story a little while ago, Khan doesn't necessarily want to fall, but he has a lot of circumstances that makes his fall essentially inevitable. And Angron has a lot of the same kind of things. Like, Angron has the ingredients of a good character, we just don't ever really get to see any of it, and he ends up just being an angry shit that destroys his legion for no particular reason other than, well, if I have to suffer, guess I'll drag you down too. <sighs> Which doesn't exactly make for an overly sympathetic character. But beyond that obvious problem, Betrayer is a book that I have a lot of issues with, so, um, uh, this will be a little bit more of a complainy Horus Heresy than usual. <sighs> there are parts of this book that just makes me wonder why certain other books were written at all. For example, in the very first chapter of Betrayer, the entire Furious Abyss book is ridiculed and made completely superfluous and essentially pointless, even more pointless than it already was. And the interactions between Lorgard and Magnus is also just really, really strange. But we'll get to that a little bit later. Thou hast been warned. Now, we start off with a quote from Khan. Because we would not obey where he refers to why they are no longer the Warhounds. The Emperor could not trust the World Eaters because the World Eaters were, well, undisciplined savage monsters, if I'm to be entirely bloody honest. Khan even kind of lays it out and he says that we've all drawn blood for no reason beyond drawing blood. We've all fought wars and exalted in their victory, despite knowing full well that those wars never had to be fought in the first place. And why? Well, it is because they are inflamed with the passion of the Butcher's Nails. And that is one of the interesting parts as well. So, the Butcher's Nails. They are an absolute abomination who serve only one purpose, to make the World Eater's Legion less. To make them less of an effective fighting force. To make them less effective soldiers. To make them less effective conquerors. To make them less disciplined. The Butcher's Nails grant nothing to the word bearers and would eventually destroy the entire Legion. And they are, of course, the blessing, quote-unquote, of their Primarch Angron. And eventually, his legion's desperate urge to be recognized by the Primarch, to be loved in some twisted way, was the reason why so many of them chose to embrace the Butcher's Nails. Eventually, of course, it was made illegal through Imperial Decree to continue the implementation of these things, but... Well, nobody apparently listened to that, and it continued ahead. See, this is one of the reasons why, like, 
There is many ways in which you can argue that the Emperor was far from a perfect father, absolutely, but the amount of leniency he showed to his sons, Lorgar being one example, as he was blatantly flaunting Imperial degree, creating temples to the worship of the Emperor, despite Big E going no, but Angron is an even bigger one. Angron not only degraded his legion, endangered it, and rendered it into a less useful fighting force, he made it uncontrollable, he made it savage, he made it well, flat out evil, a collection of war criminals. Even the Eighth Legion, the Ninth Lords, had a reason for the atrocities they were carrying out. They had a rationale. They were of the opinion, in fact, that they were doing the humane thing. The only humane war is a short war. And by carrying out acts of unrivaled atrocity, the Eighth Legion did just that. They ended wars. On some occasions, before a single shot was even fired, the mere mention of their presence was enough to pacify systems. Of course, it didn't work out in the long run, but the basic idea, especially when your goal is to pacify an entire galaxy, is a sound one. Terror is absolutely a weapon, and if wielded correctly, it can prevent a great deal of otherwise unavoidable suffering. But again, of course, the World Eaters didn't care about that. They spilled blood purely for, well, the act of spilling blood in and of itself. That was their only real rationale, that was their only real goal and reason for their actions. And they seem to almost revel in it, to glory in it, to, oh, take joy in it. And yet, the Emperor never outright censored them. He should have. The World Eaters should honestly probably have been wiped from Imperial records. When Angron was first discovered, the Emperor probably should have shot the bastard right then and there. But being the softy father he clearly was, he didn't. And the galaxy would certainly suffer for that mistake. Oh, and by the way, on, you know, the topic of mistakes, uh, isn't Karn dead? Yes, yes, kinda. You remember back during the, you know, first books in the Horus Heresy, the Great Betrayal and so on, where he was rammed by a, what was it, a land raider, a massive tank, who impaled Karn on the rubble-clearing spikes at the front? Yeah, <laughs> he's, he's, he's fine, don't worry about it. I mean, we all knew he'd be fine, because, you know, he'd be still alive in modern day 40k, but... I do hate these half-assed measures. If you're gonna kill a character, just fucking kill him, but... Anyways, moving on. We meet Lorgar as he has a conversation with Magnus. Not in person, mind you. Magnus is casting his presence across the galaxy to speak to Lorgar. And he is doing it with such force, with such power, that at one point in the conversation, Lorgar mentions that he can basically smell Magnus in the room as if he was really there. Now this, of course, is a pretty big deal, because remember the Thousand Sons book? Where Magnus had to carry out a ginormous ritual that required an absurd amount of time, preparation, and the lives of tons of acolytes to carry out. The one where he needed to cast his mind to terror to warn the Emperor, you know that thing? The central plot point of the entire book, and the reason why Magnus was declared a traitor? Well, now you can just do it. Now, now, now he just does it. Now he, ugh. Now he just like, oh, Logar, pick up the phone. Yeah, I can do this shit now. It's remarkable, isn't it? I guess you could argue that he's in the Eye of Terror now, and therefore has easier access to the warp energies required to fuel this kind of ritual. But surely, after what happened with the whole Terror thing, when he was being blocked by the Emperor's wards, and then one of the sentient entities in the warp reached out and like, oh hey, Magnus, I see you're struggling there. Allow me to just destroy everything, would you? Magnus, oh, thank you, how very kind. Then he merges in the Emperor's laboratory, and then should immediately go, oh. Ow. 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 <laughs> You'd think he'd be somewhat hesitant to call upon those powers again, but nope, nope. He just does this now. 
the, the, the core part of a thousand suns just whoosh, right out the window. Right, sure, okay. What more to Hedersy do we have in store? Well, um, Lorgar is bitching and whining, of course. As per usual. I really do not like Lorga. I know a lot of people really liked, um, you know, the first Heretic and how it made Lorga into what he was. I, I hate that interpretation. I think it is fundamentally flawed, because not at any point does ADB really explain why he's doing this. All we have is Lorga going like, oh, oh, I don't want to do this, this is horrible, as he goes ahead and does it with merely, not even, like, barely even an instance of hesitation. Again, I will never let this go. When the, when Logan asks the demon, will you hurt my sons? And the demon goes, yeah, I'm gonna fucking kill the little bitches after torturing them. Logar then spends a couple hours mulling this over and then sends his sons into the Eye of Terror anyways. He's a monster. He's absolutely a monster. And he is the worst kind of monster because... He does not take even the slightest hint of responsibility for it. Magnus asks him what the massive tides of death and destruction he can feel all the way in the Eye of Terror irradiating out from Kalth is, and Logar has the sheer brass balls to go, oh, that, oh, that's, that's core fed on an Erebus is doing, you know. They're, they're, they're the bad ones here. Look, bitch. <laughs> You allowed them to go there. No, not, not just allowed them to go there. What they're doing at Kalth is a key part of your ritual to summon forth the Ruin Storm. Indeed, you will even in this very book say that, oh, because of all of that destruction, I can now carry out my plans. Like, you... There is no way that Logar's like, oh, this is a fortuitous coincidence. <laughs> Of course not. Not to mention, of course, again, also, this is the real crux of all of this. Logar could have stopped this at any point in time. Logar could have chosen to halt the entirety of the Horus Heresy at any point. At any point, he could simply have gone, no. No, I don't think this is a good idea. I don't think the truth is worth this cost. Quote, unquote, truth as well. But again... He kept going along with it every step of the way, whinging and whining, but he kept doing it. And even now, he's referring to Core Fed on an Erebus like, oh, the warp curdles around them. <laughs> God damn it. You have done things just as bad, and he's indeed about to do atrocities just as bad as what Core Fed on an Erebus does, and yet he still has the balls to basically lambast them for their actions. Utter bloody nonsense. Adding in, of course, the fact also that Lorgar just abandoned Corferdon and Erebus at Kalth as well. You know, just adding that in on top of everything else. And again, here's the thing. If Lorgar really is so annoyed by Corferdon and Erebus and their actions, their malice, he could just shoot them. He could just bloody shoot them. It's not like he has any particular issues with that. Remember back during the first Heretic when Corferon first told Lorgar that he'd been keeping the ancient ways alive? Lorgar was considering snapping his neck. In fact, he had his hands around his neck and was choking the life out of Corferon. <laughs> There's no bonds of loyalty stopping him from killing them. There's no sentiment, no, you know, love between them. Every excuse Logar makes is just so thoroughly hollow. Which is, again, why I despise the way that he has been written as a character. Because he, the, the only reason why we are supposed to think that he doesn't like doing all of this is because he whinges at us on occasion and then continues on his mass genocide. <sighs> it really annoys me, he does. He really, really does. And just to add to this too, by the way, uh, Logar then asks Magnus, oh, what about Ahriman? Is, is he kind of like my core fed on Erebus? And Magnus goes like, yeah, he's a bad one too. Like, Magnus, you son of a... You little... You... You blame... You little... 
L let me just make one thing clear. Araman is not a golden boy, as modern day 40k is very clearly represented, although I think modern 40k does a huge disservice to Araman's actual character as he is presented in 30k. Araman in 30k seems to be a genuinely good dude, and his primary interest in 40k as well, though it usually doesn't shine through over much, is merely just to save his brothers. He wants to restore them from the state of rubric marines, and yet here Magnus is like, oh yes, the warp curdles around him too. You are literally to blame for- no, 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 I'm, I'm not- I'm not even gonna get into that. If you want to know all of the reasons why Magnus was a wrong'un, well, the Thousand Sons, uh, Horus Heresy law breakdown is there for your perusing pleasure. I'm gonna have to do a full video on Magnus at some point too, where I go just through all of it, but anywho, onwards we go. Lorgar and his World Eaters have allied themselves. <sighs> yeah, I'm gonna be making that mistake a lot. So, <clears throat> Lorgar and his Word Bearers have allied themselves to the World Eaters. Yes, that's that. That is, that is genuinely going to be rather complicated. I think keeping those two little bastards separated. Anywho. The allied traitor fleets are closing in on a world of Ultramar known as Armatura. It is apparently the single largest war world in Ultramar, a ginormous armory and arms manufacturing center that provides the Ultramarines with the weapons with which to wage war, both for the legions and also presumably for the rest of them, their countless planetary defense auxiliaries and imperial army elements. This, of course, makes Armatura a very, very, very important planet indeed, for obvious reasons. And should it fall, that would be a pretty goddamn large inconvenience to the Imperium. And Ultramar, in particular. This is why it also possesses a significant garrison and a defense fleet of Ultramar that is known as the Evocati Fleet. I like that name, the Evocati Fleet. It's a good name that I quite enjoy. And Lorgar and the World Eaters and World Bearers are attacking it with a relatively small force, which makes Magnus wonder what the hell precisely Lorgar is up to, because surely his relatively small naval elements will be wiped out of the skies with ease by the massed ultramarines evil Carty fleet, the absolute ludicrous quantity of orbital based weaponry, and of course the planetary weaponry as well. Huge orbital defense silos and star fortresses aplenty. Magnus even says at one point that he is not in the mood to see two legions wiped out in the skies above Armatura, but Logard assures him that he has has a plan. He has something in mind with which to deal with these defenders. The two get into a rather heated argument, and I mean, they absolutely should. As Magnus accurately points out, the reason why his legion has been chased off into the Eye of Terror, the reason why it is scattered and broken, and why he himself, of course, well, was broken over Ross's knee is because of Lorgar's rebellion. He even points out that the very first heart to turn traitor in this conflict was none other than Lorgar. It's interesting how he knows that. I presume Lorgar told him? Because otherwise, how would Magnus really know that as an absolute fact? Certainly, some demonic entities may have whispered it in his mind, but again, considering the uh, unfortunate history that Magnus has with those creatures, I, I somehow doubt that he'd just be like, oh, I see. Right, well, I'll take that as gospel right off the bat then. Maybe I'm giving Magnus too much um, of the benefit of the doubt here. <laughs> I genuinely think that might actually be part of the problem. But 
Anywho, Lorgar then goes on that, oh no, no, don't, don't worry, brother, don't worry, I've, I've got a solution for this, I know how to handle this huge fleet and all of this nonsense, I've got a plan, he says. And what is the plan? Well, at first, he makes it sound as if it's some kind of supernatural nonsense. He talks about how Kalth, uh, all of the death there, is providing the backdrop to his actions. How Corferon's plans, which he totally didn't endorse or anything, mind you, is like, oh, no, 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 the, the warp curdles around them, Magnus. Don't you forget that. Um, and Magnus is like, okay, but... No matter how much you tear the veil here, no matter how much warp fuckery you commit here, there is no way that you are going to be able to break this kind of defenses just utilizing that. Now, of course, I'd probably uh, offer a response to that in that Magnus may not have been paying attention, but... Uh, the warp can do quite a lot of, uh, of insane shit, and honestly, if he really truly could manifest the kind of nonsense that we see later on in 40k, now may maybe he could, maybe he actually could take over Armatura just with warp nonsense, because again, millions upon millions of demonic entities falling from the skies, useful innovation strategy, but no, no, that's not actually at all what Lorgar is planning. No, what he's planning is something far more stupid and far more insulting as well. Remember how I talked about how this book essentially makes the Furious Abyss entirely bloody pointless? Well, Lorgar raises his hands like a conductor in an orchestra, and voila, not one, but two exact replicas of the Furious Abyss emerge from the warp. The Furious Abyss was already a pretty damn pointless novel in and of itself because it added virtually nothing to the Horus Heresy overall, but at the very least it added a sense of drama, you know? It added a sense of wonder, like, oh my god, this ginormous super ship, bigger than anything else ever constructed dwarfing even the Gloriana-class battleships, the capital vessels of the Primarchs. That was something. I mean, that, that, was, that, was, that was a beast to be slain, you know? That was a monster that needed hunting down. And you can see why they might have thought, like, okay, this is a pretty cool setting for a novel. Even though it doesn't add much, at least it's a cool, unique setting. It's a unique threat to McCrag and the Imperium. All of that, straight out the window, because Lorgar built two more of them. And that is, of course, before we even remember to mention that these things were built in secret. The Glorious Abyss was built in secret. A ginormous, unrivaled warship constructed in secret. Now, already in the Furious Abyss, I was like, ah, uh, doubt. Doubt. Very, very big doubt. Especially as this was built within the solar system, within farting distance of the Imperial Palace and the Custodes, which once again, in an Aaron Dembski Bowden novel, is just com a completely non-existent entity. The Custodians can smell out, no, not, not even a straight-up seditious element, the supposition, the possibility of a seditious element in Hugh Brazil, the Custodians figure that out. Three unrivaledly massive warships constructed within the confines of the solar system, each of them larger than anything ever fitted, each of them using technology never before really seen, all of them using incredibly skilled shipwrights, and as astronomic quantities of resources. Nope, nope, no, nope, nope, didn't see a shit of this, didn't see none of this. It's, God, it's just, it cheapens the universe. It, it, and yeah, it, it, I don't, I don't even need to explain this, do I? I think everybody already knows that this is some dumb shit. It made the entire Furious Abyss book 
pointless, and it made the retardation in the Furious Abyss, the fact that this apparently, again, was some kind of secret, despite the seeming impossibility of that, and just, ex just exacerbates it even more. Heaping idiocy upon idiocy is not a good thing. Not to mention, it also massively cheapens this engagement. Instead of Lorgard actually using the warp, using his magic, using his knowledge, using his occult skills, using his allies, or using a plan, instead he's just like, oh, by the way, I magically have two other ships that can destroy anything and everything in the entire galaxy. Teehee. <laughs> <sighs> lazy, lazy, lazy. But why is Logar doing all of this? Well, it's for love of his brother Angron, of course. And Magnus even goes so far as to point out that, really? Really? You're doing this for, for, for Angron? Why? Well, apparently because Angron is dying. Um... We don't really know how, but Lorgar just simply states that Angron is dying because of his implants. Apparently, the Butcher's Nails have finally decided that, you know, they've had enough of Angron's bullshit and are now going to kill him, which, uh, <laughs> to be fair, I'm not necessarily an opponent of, and neither is Magnus. He too is pretty much just like, well, I mean, would the galaxy really miss Angron? Would we really be worse off if he ended up dead? And Lorgard again, it's a little bit, ah, well, you know, you underestimate him, you shouldn't be so mean to our brother. Yes, he's a psychopathic moron who's made this campaign infinitely more difficult due to his ridiculous urge to slaughter every single population center we come across, but still, you know, he has his charms. I suppose. Then again, as we have all realized by now, what Lorgar considers charming is um, perhaps not what the rest of us would consider particularly endearing, eh? But yes, he is doing this in part to save, in part, probably, well, it's partially the Ruin Storm, it's partially this, though. I, I do, at least to a degree, believe that Lorgar is doing this because he thinks this is the right thing to do for his brother. I'll, I'll give him that much in the way of credit because for all of his ridiculously twisted views on this whole war and how he's constantly whinging about how he totally didn't want any of this except again letting it go this whole time and never trying to stop it in any meaningful way, I do still believe that he genuinely does care for his brothers, albeit in a somewhat twisted fashion, shall we say. Though... Logar does, of course, also have another agenda in mind, as we will learn about over the course of this book. But luckily, we now move on to slightly less annoying characters, as we meet Karn and Argel Tal. They are preparing uh, the assault upon Armatura, with, of course, the massive retard ships having blown apart any and all resistance in orbit, and we don't even get to see any of that. ADB, by the way, is also one of those authors who write space battles in 40k as if it is over in minutes. Uh, it's always annoyed me. 40k really needs to codify its space combat because surely, I mean, in one book, it takes a week just to get to a planet from the nearest, you know, uh, warp safe point. On other occasions, you know, Fleets reach stable orbit and begin bombarding the planet below in minutes. I'm like, holy shit. The spatial calculations for simply just reaching stable orbit alone would take longer than that. Then, of course, there's the engagement range as well. Now, in the case of um, torpedoes, there is no technical range limitation in all due reality. Except effective range, I do suppose. A torpedo with a giant engine pushing it through space will keep going for, you know, essentially all eternity. Since, well, until it hits something, I suppose. 
But obviously, these are very, very large objects with very, very large engines at the end, and therefore they tend to be rather easy to avoid. Though the torpedoes by and large also are not direct attack weapons, instead they send out a cloud of smaller warheads. Then you've got mass driver weaponry, which again has no real technical you know, maximum range beyond what is effective. Again, you know, if you fire a shell and it takes an hour to reach the target, you've got plenty of time to simply just move out of the goddamn way. As for lance weaponry, hmm, well, how does lasers work in space? Honestly, I'm not entirely sure. You wouldn't think there would be a whole lot to really you know, fuck up the energy, but then again, the sheer distance involved and the fact that it is light energy and therefore has a nasty habit of scattering somewhat, I would imagine that it might have some kind of theoretical maximum range. Well, I'm not entirely sure. I don't know how light of that magnitude performs in space, to be honest. Usually, I've got a little bit of basic knowledge about most things, but this one, I haven't the fucking faintest. Anywho, you would nevertheless imagine that the engagement ranges of these fleets would be absolutely hilariously massive, and if they are not, what possible reason could there be for them not to be absolutely hilariously massive. For surely, again, with the kind of weaponry that the Imperium possesses, massive armored prows, torpedoes in the front, lance batteries, you would actually benefit from a long engagement range and then a hammering melee, quote unquote, of a mere few hundred thousand kilometers. But again, the battle is apparently over in minutes and they're landing now. Ugh. We really do need a codex on space battles in 40k. Now, they have an interesting mention about the uh, the Dreadclaw Assault Pod, uh, uh, Drop Pod. Apparently, it's an absolute piece of shit. Oh, well, Karn really, really likes it, but it is apparently very temperamental, to the point where it apparently misfunctions all the goddamn time, and, you yeah, know, I... I would be the malfunction of a drop pod. I guess it hammers down a couple hundred kilometers in the wrong direction, or simply just explodes in a cloud of debris when fired. That would certainly qualify as a mishap, or maybe it comes down slightly off kilter. Bearing in mind as well, like, this is a drop pod hammering into the ground at only god only knows how many hundreds of kilometers per hour. If that hits at an angle and doesn't bury itself and therefore stabilize itself upon impact, hmm... Spinning, clanking horribleness comes to mind. Yeah, I, I can see the complications that uh, might occur from such a creation. I mean, hell, this should be basically impossible to survive deployment in this fashion regardless, but, you know, hey, details. And they are space marines after all. We also have an interesting little conversation between Argaltal and Karn. Apparently, the two are friends, which, I mean, considering Karn being Karn, I'm, I'm kind of like... He has friends? <laughs> really? How, how how did that come to pass? But presumably Khan is just really fond of how broken Argaltal is and kinda sees in him, I would guess, a little bit of himself. Because Khan also goes into a little bit of a dialogue about Angron and how the World Eaters Legion essentially broke itself by the usage of the nails, specifically because they hoped that it would bring them closer to their Primarch, that they would make them see the world as he saw it, and that that would inform them somehow, you know, give them an idea of why he behaves the way he does. Because apparently they're not very big fans of Angron at all, and I mean, yeah, <laughs> I, I can see why. I imagine most legions would not be particularly big fans of Angron, though ADB, and if you want to know about him, the author, uh, he kind of rehashes the same motivation from the word bearers at this point, which annoys me a little bit. Because the word bearers, there is a huge part, especially during the um, 
Not the Mark of Kalf, the, 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 you know, the one where they invade it. Was it the Mark of Kalf? No, it was something else, wasn't it? Uh, where they talk about, uh, we no longer bear the word, brother. We bear Lorgar. In that they are referring to the fact that Lorgar's just not that good of a Primarch. He's, he's not a fighter like the others. He's not a brilliant strategist like the others. He is a very flawed entity. He is less of a Primarch, more of a preacher, and while some amongst their numbers have grown to accommodate this and even appreciate it, by and large, they would much rather have a proper Primarch, a proper fighter, a proper leader, someone to inspire immediate awe in their souls, and Lorgar just wasn't quite that. And now we hear the exact same thing about Angron, how he doesn't really inspire the, the correct level of confidence, how he doesn't really lead them properly, etc, etc. And I mean, I get it. I absolutely do. Angron is a broken thing. Absolutely. It's just a little annoying to see the exact same rationale used again for another Primarch. I think that, honestly, in the case of Angron, it would be more interesting if... Because the Warhounds, the original World Eaters, before they became the World Eaters, they were still a very aggressive legion, still a very violent legion, still very much so... Vulnerable to the the whims of battle, yeah? They, they could go quite cray-cray quite quickly. Would it be more interesting if Angron first arrived? and began twisting this, pushing it further, driving the Legion more and more down this path, until it arrived at a point where it was about to break itself, essentially. Where it was almost in open rebellion, because Khan even mentions that a lot of it within the Legion really, 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 really don't like Angron. They don't like how he behaves, they don't like how he treats the Legion, how he handles things, and so on. A, a nice, big, kind of, um, almost rebellion arc, I'd say, where all of this is explored in greater detail would be very interesting, but sadly, Angron, again, is one of those primates that just don't get covered, although, well, I say sadly, considering, again, that he is piss-pool deep, perhaps this is a blessing in disguise. Angron also, when he arrives on deck, uh, greatly relishes taking the piss out of Argyltal, which I kind of appreciate, to be fair, because whilst Argyltal is certainly a far more interesting character, I'm almost starting to see a bit of a pattern here. Lorgar is a less interesting character than Argyltal. Khan is a more interesting character than Angron. Hmm, strange that. But he arrives and he starts taking the piss out of him, calling him Creature, which, again, I mean... I'm, I'm, so, I'm sorry, Argyltal, I, I kinda have to agree on that one. You are a bit of a creature, aren't you? You really are, you absolutely are. And he drives him to rage, it's like, Ah, oh, creature, I hear that whore priestess of yours got killed, and her bones got stolen too. Man, you really suck at your job, don't you? <laughs> I gotta admit, I'm kind of, I, I kind of enjoyed that part. I kind of enjoyed seeing Angron not just being an angry shit, but a cunt instead. <laughs> you know, you can appreciate a good cunt, in my opinion, more so than you can just an angry bastard. Just being angry doesn't really require any kind of personality or any kind of an interesting engagement with the story or the setting. Being a shit, however... <laughs> Well, that requires you to be a shit to someone, and for a reason, does it not? He eventually manages to get Argyltal to attack him, which is what he was kind of baiting, although I don't think he wants to take it quite that far, because apparently he still has some form of self-restraint, since he doesn't kill Argyltal, he just grabs him in mid-air and tosses him around for a bit, you know, because funny. By the way, Argyltal is also utilizing the weapons of the Custodes, the Aquilon's two-handed sword, and a Custodes spear as well, which is just another example of the Custodes being fucking shit. Because, of course, the weapons are gene-locked to the Custodes who owned them. There should be no way to break this lock, and yet Argyltal, who's not a tech priest, who's not an expert in any of this, yeah, he does it. He, he, he just does it. 
And does the book explain it? No. He just says like, oh yes, Uncle Tal overcame that problem, um, and he never told anyone how. And I'm like, that's... That's that's all that, that that's 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 all you that's all you got for me. So man does the impossible. Explanation is well, you never told anyone. <sighs> Poor fucking custodies. I, I genuinely, I genuinely feel bad for the custodies. Like they are just why? Why just give them something? Give them an give them an inch. Give give them a little thing, you know? God, they're supposed to be the emperor's elites. They're supposed to be the best. They're supposed to be specifically engineered to be kick ass, and yet apparently they can't even affix bike locks to their fucking weapons. But enough of making myself sad, um, we now get a really cool scene of the ground war for Armatura. Because, of course, they can't simply just destroy the planet from orbit, even though they have the weapons to do just that. But at least in this case, there is an explanation for it, namely, you know, Angron being Angron, basically. And the action sequences are pretty damn cool. For all of ADB's many flaws when it comes to representing the loyalists of the galaxy as anything more than brain-dead mongrel halfwits, he absolutely does action very, very well indeed. We are also now introduced to a another character, the female captain of the World Eater's flagship, The Conqueror. She is a character I quite like, Lotara Saren. She is a bit of an out-of-sorts character in amongst the World Eaters Legion, because she is a very high-class prissy lady in many ways. She is a spire-born, as she often says. She is a high-class lady, essentially, but she is also extraordinarily skilled at what she does, and this is demonstrated quite thoroughly throughout the book as well. She wears no commendations to, except for one, a bloody red handprint plastered right in the middle of her chest, a commendation from Angron himself, the only one that she wears openly. I quite like her. She has this kind of mix of aggression and competence that I quite like, and the competence is built up as well. She is a high-born spire noble from an advanced planet with a long and storied history in the Imperial Navy. I could absolutely see such a woman being in a position of power, even in the World Eaters Legion, where uh, one would think that they would... Honestly, I'm a little bit surprised that they don't command their own ships, or, well... It's kind of a mix of things. On the one hand, the World Eaters don't care about anyone if they aren't strong enough. There is even a talk a little bit previously when they're on the embarkation decks ready to make the landing on Armatura, how one of them killed one other world bearer. World bearer, Jesus. World eater in the gladiatorial pits, and how everybody liked him, and that didn't stop his head from rolling across the sand. And also, the world. B Jesus. Well, this is gonna be a real pain in my ass. The word bearers contingent aboard under Argeltal had also participated in the gladiatorial pits in fights to train themselves. The World Eaters don't seem to respect much, if anything, besides strength. And so them trusting their ships to mortals, on the one hand it feels kind of off, but on the other I can also absolutely see the reason for it, since every self-respecting world eater would of course want to be in the thick of the fighting, instead of commanding some ship shooting at the enemy a thousand kilometers away, you know? She's also Angron's favorite, to the point that he actually talks to her almost like an equal, or, you know, as close to it as Angron ever gets, and it's probably because of the incredibly irreverent nature that she has. She does not talk to him in um, any kind of nice or submissive way, and Angron hates anything that's even 
remotely resembles submissiveness. It's even mentioned that the only honorific he even vaguely tolerates is Sire. Anything else, he is likely to respond to with violence. And God help you if you decide to bow before him, because in Angron's mind, bowing is something that only dying men or frightened animals do. And he'll have to make you into one of those two. And yet... And yet, Lotara still needles him with just that kind of stuff. I think, again, that is why Angron likes her and tolerates her so much, and genuinely listens to her too. When the Remembrancers were first attached to the World Eaters, you'd think they'd be thrown off pretty quickly, but no, Angron actually tolerated them, or, well, ignored them and didn't fucking care, more like. But when Lotara Sarin complained about their presence just once... They were off the ship the next day. And we get a wonderful little example of it too. She calls up Angron on the Vox and manages to get a hold of him in the midst of battle, impressive in and of itself. That shows you how much respect he has for her. And she briefs him that the Ultramarines are up to some trickery up ahead, collapsing buildings in prepared positions, and also requesting permission to attack the Titan foundries of Armatura from orbit. How she... You know, I was about to say how she's going to have time to do that, you know, achieving stationary orbit, solid orbit, then engaging the targets, then firing, all whilst hovering just above the planet's atmosphere in an incredibly exposed position while still engaged with the Evocati fleet and the defense platforms, mind you. I don't know, I, I was going to point that out, but again... <sighs> We need a fucking 40k Void War Codex, we really do, because in every other work I think I've ever read, not to mention logically as well, if you take a massive spaceship and you place it in geosynchronous orbit above the target you want to attack, as close as safe to the skein of the planet's atmosphere so as to maximize the effect of your bombardment and minimize the atmosphere's effect upon the bombardment, you would be a sitting duck. And even worse than that, if you were to lose engine power, down into the planet you go, but again, never mind, the rules of Void War seem to change ever more. Anywho, the funny part is, she refers to him as my lord, and he immediately bites back, I'm no one's lord. You're always very brave with me when I'm thousands of miles away. <laughs> I like that, that's... That See, that adds a little bit of warmth to Angeron's character, something he is severely lacking in. She eventually cuts the communication and marks that Khan is right, the Primarch is getting worse. So, it's not just Lorgar then that has noticed this, apparently, the rest of the Legion is also starting to worry about Angeron's state of mind, which is very interesting. We now return to Khan for a while, as he is still engaged, of course, with the Ultramarines. He has sought out a group of word bearers, and we get a look here into the relationship between the two. The word bearers and the world eaters, that is, and it is very strained. Indeed, the two parties had almost begun shooting at each other in the void, with weapons locked and loaded, and boarding pods prepared and ready to shoot across the void and into the other fleet. The fight was only prevented by, apparently, them coming across a Xenos fleet? Which raises many questions again. Really? You're, you're on the way to Ultramar? You're, you're in Ultra. Was it outside of Ultrama? Was it within Ultrama? Where did you find these Xenos? Were you traveling in real space at the time? If so, why were you traveling in real space? Why weren't you in the warp? Did you happen across them? Was there a Xenos world nearby? Did you attack that? Like Angoron attacked everything else? Why are there Xenos this deep in the Imperium? This close to Ultrama? Many, many questions, but let's just move on, shall we? At the point in time when they're attacking Armatura, the two legions, um, well, as it is somewhat colorfully described in the book, a briefing is considered to be a rip-roaring success if the two parties limit themselves to merely spitting at one another across the table instead of engaging in open violence with each other. But right now, they had to cooperate. 
Khan requisitioned a small squad of word bearers to push forward into a massive trap laid by the ultramarines. They had collapsed many of their buildings, massive structures used as barracks and fortresses, directly on top of the World Eater's elements, including Angron, who were currently engaged in the business of seizing those very self-same structures. This had succeeded in trapping Angron beneath the falling structures, and was actually getting surprisingly close to killing him, although in a somewhat strange way. So. Angron came to, confused and lost to the nails, and began digging in just whatever direction he picked, really. Any direction was better than inaction as far as Angron was concerned. However, he chose the incorrect path. He started about a 30 meters or so from the surface, and by the time he came to, he was 2 to 300 meters beneath the surface, which how he even managed to dig down that far? God Emperor only knows, but he was eventually brought back from his state by a so-called communion, a sharing of souls and minds of the 19 last psychers in the World Eaters Legion. The fact that the World Eaters Legion even has psychers kind of shocks me, especially as Angrion, Angrion also retorts that once the last of them are dead, his lesion will be cleaner, and that he despises them. Angron kills people for funsies, and yet he tolerates librarians? Huh, interesting. Anywho, the last 19 of them form a communion, which is very dangerous, and they've done this several times before as well, with considerable casualties, but they manage to wake Angron back up again, and point him in the correct direction. There is some interesting little tidbits here. Uh, for example, Angron curses every day he is alive. He wishes that he had died with his rebels, which I get. I mean, we all knew that. Again. Why the hell the Emperor didn't just kill the... I've already talked about that. I won't get back into it again. But... He doesn't like the position he is currently in. He loathes his legion. He loathes the position he is in. He loathes the fact that he didn't die on Deshea. And whilst he has tried to tell himself again and again that he really is this other person, that he really is this Angron, the leader of the World Eaters Legion, but no matter how hard he tries, he can never quite convince himself of that. This also gives us an alternative explanation to how the nails are supposedly killing him. Not by actually killing him, but by driving him so loco that he will eventually manage to get himself killed by, say, for example, burrowing himself in the dirt. I mean, that kind of is an explanation, I suppose. How the hell he's going to kill himself by burying himself, though, I'm not entirely sure. I mean, Gilliman was able to survive in the void, walking on the skin of a spaceship, and yet Angron's gonna die from digging? <laughs> okay, right. There's also a lot of talk about how his, um, his arms are bleeding, his fingers are bleeding, but he's a Primark. And, and he's cutting himself open on, on ground, on earth, on rock, to the point that it could actually threaten his life? What? <laughs> We've seen other Primarchs get shot in the head and get back up again after a couple of minutes. I mean, a curse at one point was impaled upon the lion's two-handed sword and basically had his spine severed, and he's still fine, and yet Angron's gonna die from digging? I <laughs> Alright, I, uh, I guess he's... Yes, he's far more delicate than he appears. Even up in orbit, Lorgar goes, Ah, that retarded brother of mine, and teleports himself down to the surface below to try and save Angron, whereupon he pulls a gunship out of the sky with the power of his mind. <laughs> All right. Logar's been taking some lessons from Magnus since we last saw him. Fair enough. He can even deploy a Kine shield now, to the point where Bolter and Lazfire just spanks off it harmlessly. 
When did he... Never mind. More questions. Questions are not my friend. That's what I've started to realize at this point. I do like actually, you know, the fighting though. The fighting's really cool. And I like how cavalier the world eaters are about it all. There is one scene shortly after this when Khan is watching Lorgar start digging in the soil after Angron, where Skarn walks up to him and goes like, Yo, Captain, you're gonna fucking love this. Just... Feel the ground for a moment, Karnas like, it's shaking. Titan treads? And Skarn just nods happily, I imagine with this dumbass fucking smiling look on his face as he goes, Yeah, and not a single one of them is on our side. <laughs> it reminds me of the Space Wolves novels, it really does. And speaking of wolves, we also get introduced to the crew of a warhound titan called the Queen of Wolves. They too will actually be one of my favourite parts of this book because I quite like the idea of titan combat. And especially the way it's described in this book as well, the warhound kind of combat. It's really quite interesting, although they will commit a bit of a crime later on, but... Oh well, details. So we'll wrap this first episode up on one last point of just... God, I swear to God, I didn't notice this much wrong the first time I read this book, but now it's all really standing out to me. So, in combat with the Queen of Wolves, a Vindicator fires a shell at the Warhound Titan, and as you would obviously expect, it hits the Void Shields, detonates, and that's it. It's a Warhound Titan. It can eat up a shell from a Vindicator, easy peasy, no problems, and then the Warhound kills it. All right. Then we move on to Lorgar, digging for Angron, and a Warhound Titan of the Ultramarines Legion, or, you know, their attached Titan Legion, moves into the pit where Lorgar is digging and points its weaponry at the Primarch, readying to fire, at which point Lorgar raises his hand and picks up a piece of debris the size of an APC and then shoots it against the Warhound, crushing its cockpit. All right, that sounds cool, but what happened to its void shields? Yeah, <laughs> god damn it. Ah, uh, it, it's like, I, I get it, I get it. Rule of cool, but just seconds before this, you reminded us that Titans have void shields, and in this particular scenario, the Ultramarines and the Legion elements, uh, the Titan Legion elements they are bringing up, are practically unopposed because the rest of the world eaters have gotten their shit kicked in and are still recovering from the controlled detonation ambush that the Ultramarines launched on them. There is no way there is enough heavy ordnance nearby to deal with a Warhound Titan's void shields just at the snap of a finger. And I do not buy either that, okay, a chunk the size of a Rhino APC. Right, that's a mighty big piece of rock, but it does not contain within it the more energy than a Vindicator shell. That is nonsense. Ay, ay, ay. So, right, I'm gonna wrap it up right there because I'm starting to get a bit of a headache. I'm sorry, I, I don't want to come down so hard on this book because, again, I really love the action sequences, but god damn it! Oh, there's just too many little things that are wrong and just really annoy me here. Anywho, until next time, I've been Arch. Thank you all very much for listening, and I hope to see you all again soon. Till then, have a good day.